everything under control. I don't care about the circumstances of my life. You shouldn't care about the circumstances of your life, What you should be caring about right now. God, am I hearing you? And if you're hearing God, you're going to walk away from stress, you're going to walk away from oppression, you're going to walk away from aggravation, and you're going to walk in love, joy, and peace. Amen? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So my message tonight that I want to share with you is the purpose of tongues. What is the purpose of tongues? Why do we even want to pray in tongues? So turn to chapter 3, and I want to spend time with the scripture, probably more so than with the outline, but we'll get through the whole thing together. There are some things in this, in this passage of scripture that we need to hear, because it deals with... Anybody here besides me, carnal, once in a while? Once in a while, you're just plain old carnal. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, let's deal with that, okay? But this scripture will help us out a little bit. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and I'll start with verse 1. Paul writes, I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal people, babes in Christ. I don't know how the congregation received that statement because I wasn't there. And for the most part, that would be very difficult for most pastors to say to his congregation, to walk up to the pulpit and say, I'm talking to you as a bunch of carnal babies. But that's what he said. And because there are a bunch of carnal babies sitting here, you're not having spiritual perception. And you're probably not going to know what I'm teaching when I get through this, you know. That, I'm just paraphrasing, all right. But let's read again. Our brethren could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal believers, babes in Christ. I fed you with milk, not with solid food. For until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able for you're still carnal. For where there is envy, strife, and division among you, are you not carnal, behaving like mere men, just everybody else? Okay. One of the things I have noticed in not this church, we're perfect. <laughs> but in those other churches, I have noticed that if a person has an issue or a problem or uh, a conflict, instead of going to the party involved, they go to their friends. And I understand that, except for one thing, it's a gossip session. It's not productive. It's just playing the same old reel over and over and over, and it produces no were no good fruit, okay? And so what I'm asking you to do is when you hear this in those other people in those other churches, okay, uh, lovingly say, hey, look, why don't you and I go talk to that person and let's deal with the real issue where the real issue is. And trust me, it would stop a lot of the division that's taking place in the church. This is also true with denomination. Every denomination in this country right now is going through conflict because this little group says, that little group believes, this little, you know, instead of them coming together as believers and saying, okay, God, where are you in this miss? And quite honestly, if we were to get the mind of God, there wouldn't be 532 different denominations in this country, you know? It would be the body of Christ that believes just like I do. Oh, brother. 
All right, we, we, you got my point. I think you got my point, okay? And so you see this as we read further. For example, verse 4. For when one says, I am of Paul, and another says, I am of Apollo, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers through whom we believe as the Lord gave to each one. Paul said, I planted Apollos watered. They had two different kinds of ministry. But God gave the increase. You can't do without the ministry of the planter if there's no water. And the ministry of watering will do no good if there's no planting. Yes. This is what we're dealing with when we talk about the end time revival, spiritual awakening, or whatever you want to call it, okay? So verse 7, so then, neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters. God gives the increase. Look down at verse 10. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I laid the foundation. Now he's talking to the Corinthian church. I came in here and laid a foundation. That Corinthian church, dear Lord, they had more problems than you can shake a stick at. If they couldn't find one, they created one. Just for the fun of it, I think sometimes. It's amazing what you read in the Corinthians. I laid the foundation. Another builds on it. But let each one take heed, pay attention how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, straw, each one's works will become clear on the day, capital D, on the day, talking about the judgment, great white throne judgment, or the judgment seat of Christ, to declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire which tests each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Do you not know that you're the temple of God and that the Holy Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles or attempts to destroy the temple of God, God will destroy it or him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Look at your neighbor and say, we're the temple of God. So when cancer comes your way, what's God going to do about it? Do you believe that? Let's try this. When COVID comes your way, what's God going to do about it? We're a temple of God. God will take care of his house. If you'll take care of his business in your house. And his business in your house is his word and his spirit. And when the word and the spirit come together, you have power, you have signs and wonders, and you have overflow. Amen? How many of you are in the word? I mean, you're faithfully, don't raise your hand, you don't have to on that, because some of you might be forced to tell an untruth. How many of you, quality time, you spend regularly quality time in the Word of God, day by day by day, that's the most important thing next to the cup of coffee. Amen. What about praying in the Spirit, especially if you have the baptism in the Holy Spirit? Pray in the Spirit every day, every day, every day, every day, all the time, all the time, all the time. And what happens after a while? Paul said pray without ceasing. And I taught you on this a couple of weeks ago, that prayer means interaction with God, not just talking to God. It's interaction with God. The two of you doing something together. And so when Paul said pray without ceasing, what he said was interact with God all the time. Even to the point, uh, God, should I have that second cup of coffee? 
Uh, God, do we have time for this? Now, God, you know what I've done all day long. Is it okay for me to sit down here for an hour and a half and watch a movie on TV? You may be surprised how much God changes some of your daily habits. That's right. Amen. And I believe that we're coming to a moment where, as believers, our first priority is going to be interaction with God. Amen. Everything else is going to have to take a, a back seat. Now, we'll see how this all works out. So with having said that, go with me to chapter 13. Chapter 13, and look with me in verse 8. Chapter 13, verse 8. Love never fails. Now, I, I, I chose this scripture because I hear an argument on this all the time about that tongues will cease. I hear this argument about tongues was for the day of Pentecost. It's not for us today because Paul said tongues would cease. And that's totally out of context and totally incorrect. So here's what I'm showing you. Verse 8. Love never fails. Whether they be prophecies, they'll fail. Whether they be tongues, ah, oh, they shall cease. There it is right there, preacher. Whether they be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Now, hold on. Nobody ever come to me and say, well, we're going to get more, more and more stupid unless they... I won't go into politics. Okay. <laughs> I'm bad. But anyway, is knowledge going to vanish away? Did you know that in the next 24 hours, with all of our modern technology, we will create new knowledge that is equivalent to all of the knowledge acquired by man since the beginning of time until yesterday. And so I have a, did you, I don't think you got what I just said. All right. In college, I took a course in history, not my favorite subject. Do you know how much history has happened since I graduated from college? Tell us. <laughs> They may take this out of the video, but after my class at Teen Challenge yesterday, there was an invasion of about eight students coming to me at one time, and I thought, what are they going to do, tackle me? And they had a ringleader speaker. He got right in my face, and these big dudes, you know. He said, preacher, I've got a question for you. Okay. Have you used toilet paper all your life? I said, what? He said, no, 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 you misunderstood. No, I didn't, I heard what you said, okay. And then I realized what was happening. I said, no. As a kid, we used Sears and Roebuck catalogs and newspaper. And we had an outhouse, not an in-house. He turned around to the rest of the guy, see, I told you so. I have no idea what that has to do with this lesson. But my point is, in the last 24 hours, man has acquired new knowledge that amount to more than what had been acquired since the beginning of time. There's no way we can keep up with that except in the spirit. I could care less about the Dow Jones average. You know what I care about? My God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory by and through Christ Jesus. There's a commercial on the radio that says, Can you afford to lose another 30% of your 401? Somebody said, Not me, I don't have any. <laughs> but anyway, 
But my, th- my thing is this. There's another commercial that says, you had better start filling your pantry full of this food, and if you'll send us $50, we'll send you a supply for four members of your family for the next three months, or whatever the price is on there. You know what? We went through this in the year 1999, going into the year 2000. The computers are going to crash. Everything's going to crash. There's not going to be any way to buy anything on the market. People are going to starve to death. You bet. My brother-in-law filled his garage full of stuff. (laughs) Invested thousands of dollars. You know what I told him? I said, when I get hungry, I'm going to come shoot you and get your food. God has not given us a spirit of fear, That's right. but of love, yes. power, and a sound mind. Yes. Now, when I said love, I want you to understand that love is a fruit of the Spirit. And the verse that I read to you says, love never fails. That is a fruit of the Spirit. It is not the power of the Spirit. Hello? Hello? You shall receive love, power, and right thinking. You need the fruit of the Spirit, you need the power of the Spirit, and you need the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ means the mind of the anointed one with the anointing that breaks every yoke of bondage. Now, folk, I'm sharing stuff with you tonight that you don't hear in Sunday morning sermons across this land. People didn't go to church to hear that. They go to church to come away with something that makes me feel good about myself so that I can make it through the week and be back next Sunday morning for some more of that same medicine to make me feel good so I can go back out into the world and survive until the following Sunday so I can come back and get some more. And folks, you and I are suffering from that situation, and that's why we have a generation out there that does not know the power of God. And thank God for people like the Ashbury University saying, all you old folk, go find you another place to worship God. We'll keep the younger generation here until they get fired up and have some understanding, and then we're going to turn them loose on you old folk and get you old folk fired up. Yes. Amen. 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 I'm telling you, I'm telling you. But here's the thing. The older generation does know the truth. Whether they've been living it and practicing is irrelevant to this point. God is about to break loose through his people. So I'm going back to my scripture, verse 8. Love never fails. Whether there be prophecies, they will fail. Whether there be tongues, they will cease. Whether there be knowledge, it will vanish away. We know in part. We prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect, complete, has come, then that which is in part, shall be done away with. And we're talking about Jesus coming, but we're not talking about just Jesus coming in the future. We're talking about what's going on right now, leading into the future. Jesus has come into my heart and into my life. Jesus has come into your heart and into your life. He's still coming. He hasn't, all of him has not arrived in revelation, knowledge, and understanding. All of him is in us. We just don't know it. Every time I opened my computer, I learned something new. It was in there all the time. I just didn't know it. Okay? Reading further, verse 11. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now we look in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am also known. Now listen to this. Now abides... Faith, hope, love. These three. The greatest of these, greater than faith, greater than hope, is love. Oh, well, hold, 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 hold on, hold on. My Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God. True. And love is more important. For God so loved he gave that which was most precious do I love God oh yes 
Do I love God to the point that I have given to him that which is most precious to me? And it's not material stuff. And it's not my family. It's not my spouse. It's me. And I can say that with no hesitation. I don't like me that much. The second commandment, love your neighbor as you love yourself. You are the temple of God, and if you don't take care of that temple with love, loving yourself, loving yourself, loving yourself, God's going to step on your toes. And I said it in a nice way. Amen? Amen. And so look look with me one more time. Verse 13, and now abides. This is what's in existence. Faith is in existence. Hope is in existence. Love is in existence. These three, the greatest of these is love. Pursue love. And desire spiritual gifts. Especially that you may prophesy, edify, exhort. Now, I just wondered if less than 50% of this room like to get in front of people and talk. I just wonder how many of you would come to me and say, I'd do better (laughs) one-on-one. Hello, we don't have time for one-on-one. Let's get busy. Well, I don't know what to say. He does. That's why the baptism in the Holy Spirit is important. Paul said, don't be afraid to get up and talk. He goes on and says, if you don't know what to say, don't worry about it. God will put the words in your mouth. Once I learned that is when the gift of prophecy began to work. Same thing with giving a message in tongues and interpretation. Look at your outline with me. In the introduction, there's more to being filled with the Holy Spirit than speaking in tongues, but tongues are an initial integral of receiving the Holy Spirit. Paul said, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. Point two, point one, the tongues is an important part of the Holy Spirit baptism. Tongues had never been done away with. We just read scripture there. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 13 in those verses 8 through 12 states love never fails even if all else fails. Love is the fruit of the Spirit, not the gift of the Spirit. Speaking in tongues is an act of worship that edifies God, edifies yourself, and edifies others. Now I'm going to come back to that just in a moment. I asked you a moment ago at the end of praise and worship there to pray in tongues for a few minutes. Now, some of you struggled with that. Now, I understand if you've not received the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the initial evidence of speaking in tongues. Somebody said, how do you know you've been filled with the Holy Spirit? You will speak in tongues. If you've not spoken in tongues yet, you have not received the infilling. You've been blessed. You've been splashed on. You've had a good time. You've had a stammering lip. You've gotten happy. You've danced in the Spirit. You've run around the building. And I enjoyed that, by the way, the other night. When you took off, I was about to, I gave you room, and I thought you'd go this way, and I was going to take off behind you, and you went back that way. No, not right now. (laughs) (laughs) But I'm telling you what, I'm I'm, I'm fed up with uh, intimidated People of God, they're more concerned about what people are going to think of them instead of what God's thinking of them. I'm thinking years ago when I was a new Christian, had no family, my church was good to me, and they made sure, like Christmas time, some of these young adults with children invite me to their house to be a part of their Christmas. And, you know, to make me feel like I wasn't freeloading or something like that, I had things to do. Maybe help put up the tree or, you know, just get ready for Christmas or whatever. Sometimes it's just plain old babysitting. Room for it. Mm -hmm. But anyway, come Christmas Day, and some of them would, on 
Christmas Eve open a present, okay? But Santa Claus is coming. And so the next morning, and I'm thinking of this one particular family, he came and knocked on the, my door and said, time to get up, the kids are going to be up in a few minutes, we want to get everything ready. So we're down there, putting all this stuff under the tree, you know. And about the time we get finished and get the first cup of coffee, here come the kids bouncing down the stairs. <laughs> You know, it's hyperventilating, you know. All this stuff is around the tree, and they're going, ooh, and they, they attack it. And they grab, this one's mine, this one's mine, this one's yours, this one's mine. And they start ripping through wrapping paper, and wrapping paper going, they wrap all the paper off of this one. Oh, yeah, yeah, boom, where's the next one? They run over and grab another one, they tear all the paper off. Yeah, yeah, throw it down, go grab another one. Then one of the kids at the very end said, is that all? And they'd never really looked at what they had unwrapped. Mom and Dad had to tell the kid, no, that one's not yours, that one's his. But I won't, no, 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 it's not. Finally, she looked over at me, I'm sitting on the couch going, mm -hmm, you know. She said, kids. And you know what popped in my spirit? Christians. I was just a baby in Christ. Now, I asked you earlier to pray in tongues. Why did I do that? Just for you to exercise your prayer language? No. But I know this. I know that every one of us in this room are dealing with something. It may be physical. I'm just tired. I'm sick. Or it may be something going on in the house, something in the family, on the job, whatever. Look at your outline with me again. Letter B. Speaking in tongues is an act of worship that edifies God, edifies self, and edifies others. So when I was asking you to pray in tongues, the first thing that would have to happen is for you to start feeling better physically, spiritually, and emotionally, so that others around you can pick up on that same spirit and they begin to feel better physically, spiritually, and emotionally, which would cause God the Father to jump off, off the throne and have a hallelujah breakdown in heaven because we are worshiping God. This is the beauty of praying in the Spirit. You say, preacher, I don't have the baptism in the Holy Spirit. God knows that. Don't put yourself down. The idea is this. Talk to God. Prayer. Pray. Interaction with God. It's a conversation. It's a lifestyle. You're walking through the day. You're doing things together. You're not by yourself. You're never alone. He's right there with you. The Holy Spirit is ready to step in. I was sharing with you last week. I want you to remind you again. You have right now in you Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You don't just get one and later get another one and later get another one. The day you got born again, you got all three of them in you all at one time. And Jesus prayed for you and me and said, Father, make them one with us as we are one. What does that possibly mean? That means that it's not Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in me. It's me in them. Are you in the Spirit? Are you in the Word? See, those are religious cliches that don't mean a whole lot to us until we begin to see what the real truth is in that statement. If I'm in the Word, Jesus is the Word. I'm in Jesus, and Jesus is in me. If I'm in the Spirit, that means I'm in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's in me. You see what I'm doing? And so Jesus is getting his prayer answered that we are one with God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let her be... Point one, praying in tongues will at times speak of and reveal divine secrets of God that may show us things to come as well as prepare us for what lies ahead. Mm -mm -mm. You know, if I had the time, I could give you story after story after story 
of how many times God interrupted my schedule. And I was praying in the spirit all of a sudden. And I had, one time I had to pull over to the side of the road because God was just so strong in the car with me. And I prayed in the spirit for several minutes. And then after that, it kind of lifted off of me and I took off only to come up on a massive wreck on the interstate and the whole place is blocked off. If the Holy Spirit had not pulled me over, I would have been right there. I had left my wife in Florida to spend some time with her mother, and I'm coming back to Azel, Texas, and I had just crossed the state line out of the, uh, Mississippi into Texas, and as I'm coming along there, you could see thunderstorms all around you and everything. The Holy Spirit said, stop under that bridge. I did not want to stop under that bridge. I'm tired. I want to get home. I'm driving. The Holy Spirit just absolutely sat down on me. It was to the point where I can't move. He said, you stop under that bridge. And I'm thinking, well, the law says you're not supposed to stop under a bridge during a storm. I was making excuses. The Holy Spirit, the third time, says, now. And I slammed on the brakes, stopped under the bridge, and a tornado went across the road in front of me. I had to repent. But folks, I want to tell you something. God knows what every situation is. Nothing that happened to you is a surprise to him, and it should not be a surprise to us. The doctor says, God already knows it, and we should know it. I went into the doctor and worked on my foot situation, and you know we went through all of that and everything, and something was not right. And I'm praying. I said, God, this isn't right. I don't know what's going on here. God said, here's what's wrong. He showed me in the mind, and I was able to show it to the doctor. He looked at me, you're right. Now we know why I got the problem. Now I've got to fix it. And so I go, physical therapy to fix it. Yes. I did one thing right to Monday. She said, you did real good. You know what happened? Oh, yeah, I, do. <laughs> I said, well, thank you. She said, you know what that means? Yep. Even exactly. We're going to get tougher tomorrow. Yep. So pray for me. <laughs> Point two in your outline. Tongues is for edification. Tongues, among other manifestations and functions of the Holy Spirit, is a sign to the unbeliever. For the believer, tongues is for spiritual edification, charging your battery. We already talked about that. To build you up in your most holy faith, it also means to encourage and to strengthen. And I hear uh, too many Christians, especially in the charismatic Pentecostal ranks, talking about being all beat up and down in the dumps and whining and complaining and everything. And what you're telling me, and I can't just come to you, well, it's your fault, I can't, you know, but they don't want to hear that. They want me to sympathize. But the truth of the matter is, when Jesus was overwhelmed like this, you go back and you read your Bible, he often withdrew himself to the mountain, to the hillside, the countryside, to pray. And what he was doing was strengthening himself. You can't just give out and give out and give out and give out and give out. You've got to get something in here that, that applies to physical things. It applies to mental and emotional things. It applies above all to spiritual things, okay? Encourage yourself in the Lord. Strengthen yourself in the Lord. Build yourself up in your most holy faith. And the best way to do it, believe me, is praying in tongues, using the Word of God, walking in the Spirit. Let us see, when a person is speaking to God in tongues, only God understands him. Even Satan doesn't know what is being communicated. The devil does not know anything about you unless you tell him or show him. He can't read your mind. He doesn't know what you're thinking. We're good at telling him and showing him, oh my God. Oh, my God, I hurt so bad. Oh, I'm sick all over. Oh, I don't know about that mother-in-law. God, I wish God would take her out and kill her or something. Oh, I just got all kinds of... And the devil said, yeah, tell me some more. Come on, tell me some more. Come on, tell me some more. Now, don't you kind of feel bad? Don't you feel that you're coming down with something? You know, that could be cancer. You might, you know, I'm telling you. 
You hear all kinds of junk going on in your head, and you wonder, where is that coming from? You created it. Just as you create the joy of the Lord, you create where you are spiritually. Looking at your outline one more time, under letter C, point one. Speaking in tongues is a supernatural way to magnify God when we feel that our thoughts and expressions are not enough. Now that's me. You know, I can tell God, God, I love you. And inside of me, I'm thinking, because of my past, I had a difficulty learning to love and express love. Uh, a lot of that was family, a lot of that was my lifestyle. And I understand now what was going on. I went to my pastor one time, and I said, can you teach me to love? He thought I was being weird. But I just, you know, I couldn't relate to that. Uh, I walk into the, uh, this, the Brownsville Church the first time. These people are going around slapping each other on the back and hugging each other. And I said, get away from me. I was still that way when I came to Azel, Texas. We was at a camp meeting over in Dallas, and I knew what they were going to do right after they got the preliminaries out of the way. They were going to have everybody stand up. We were going to have praise and worship. And I knew what the uh, moderator was going to do. He's going to turn, he had an expression. He said, I want everybody to stand up, turn to your neighbor, and give him a big squeeze. Well, my wife knew it was going to happen. And so what happened was this. She and I sat together. She put her stuff on one side of her, and I put my stuff on the other side of us so nobody could sit close to us. We're not going to get the squeeze. And a lady behind me tapped me on the shoulder, and without thinking, I turned around, and this lady was a monster. She grabbed me and said, I'm going to give you a big squeeze. And she shook my little body all over the place. And I'm saying, ah, and my wife is laughing at me. <laughs> and a man tapped her on the shoulder and gave her the big squeeze. Hello, church people. Mm. How many times has a dad picked up his kid and hugged him like that? It's genuine, folks. It's real. God's love is real. And our love for our brother and sister and for the lost is just as real. Looking at your outline one more time, and what I was saying there was my thoughts and expressions are not enough. And I say, God, I love you. Yeah, God, I really, 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 really love you. God, I know I've said that a thousand times, but I want you to know, God, I, I, I honestly, I really, really, you know, who am I trying to convince, me or him? Sunday school teacher set me free on that. She said, how many of you love God? I did like everybody else. I raised my hand. She said, tell him in tongues. Perfect praise. The Holy Spirit can tell God how much you love him in ways you never thought. And God will give you the squeeze. Point three, and I close with this. The fruit of the Spirit versus the gift of the Spirit. We'll be talking about that. If you want me to continue when we finish this series on the gift of the Spirit, please let me know. But the fruit of the Spirit is based on abiding in Christ, that is, new birth. It is not Holy Spirit baptism. Baby Christians need time to grow the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, followed by joy, peace, etc. Yet that same baby Christian baptized in the Holy Spirit can and will have power in his life. You don't have to be a mature Christian to operate in the power of God. But the fruit of the Spirit requires Growing time, planting season, watering season, and harvest season. With that, I'm done. Thank you so much for being here tonight. God bless you. Everybody say, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. According to the word, in Jesus' name. Now give him a shout. Amen.
Give somebody a squeeze before you go home. <laughs> Shout to all the people 